So let's go ahead and actually derive the distribution of these random quantities that we need to evaluate the probability of error expression. So the two quantities we're interested in are R0 and R1. What we're going to do for our analysis though is we're going to assume that S0 was transmitted and we're going to work out just the conditional probability of error given that 0 was transmitted and then the other conditional probability of error PC comma 1 will follow very easily once we understand all this math by just basically swapping the role of S0 and S1. So let's just focus now on this case, assuming S0 of T was transmitted. The probability of being correct means that R1 is less than R0. Remember, if we're transmitting S0, we need R0 to be the larger quantity. So we need this random variable R0 to be greater than the square root of U1 squared plus V1 squared. So in, under, in order to understand this, we under, need to understand what the distribution of this random quantity is. Throughout this analysis, we're going to assume that sigma 0 and sigma 1 are equal to sigma, just the same variance. This is a very common assumption. We're assuming that any mismatch in the receiver isn't significant enough to actually change the variance of the noise component of our decision statistic. So let's think about what this means. What we have right here are these two random quantities, u1 and v1. They've been squared and taken a square root. And these, this quantity, this root sum squared, is less than some number r0. So what we really have here is for some fixed number r0, the sets of points u1 and v1 that satisfy that inequality are really the points inside a circle of radius r. So we're letting r equal r0 here. And I can visualize what it means for the square root of u1 squared plus v1 squared to be less than a number is really all the points inside this circle. The probability of being correct is the probability of this joint density integrated over this circular region. So if I actually want to go back and actually compute the probability of being correct, what that really means is integrate this joint density function over this circular region in the u1 v1 plane. So that's really the error probability that we need to integrate and evaluate. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's start working out what this is so we can actually integrate that over this circular region. So again, we are actually transmitting S0 of t. When we transmit S0 of t, u1 and v1, these are the, the branches in the down in the S1 processing branch, these are just noise components only. And we've already worked through this. We know that these are zero mean, we know that they're Gaussian, and they have the same variance. And they're independent as well, and that's huge. That means we can split this joint density function into the product of two marginal density functions. And since we already know that these are zero mean with variance sigma squared, we can actually go ahead and write down the product of these two Gaussian PDFs, which is equal to this quantity right here. So we've just taken the 1 over square root, 1 over square root, and written it as just one factor. And then instead of having the product of two exponentials, we have one exponential with their exponents added together. So I can actually write out now what this probability of being correct is. It's the integral of this joint PDF over the circular region, which we're denoting C sub R. So you tell me what the radius of that circle is. I evaluate this double integral, and I can tell you what the probability of being inside that circular region is. So now our challenge becomes, how do we actually evaluate equation 5? This is kind of an ugly integral. It's a double integral, and it's over this circular region. And the challenge now becomes, how do we evaluate this integral? Well, the way we're going to evaluate this integral is we're going to switch to polar coordinates. Anytime you have a double integral over a circular region, switching to polar is definitely the kind of best approach to do that. So we're going to do a change of variables. Instead of rectangular coordinates u1 and v1, we're going to switch to polar coordinates with a radius rho and an angle theta. So u1 becomes rho cosine theta and v1 becomes rho sine theta. And then see what happens. Rho squared then is just equal to u1 squared plus v1 squared. And also, when you do the differential um, change, du1 dv1 becomes r dr d theta. So that's something you should remember from calculus um, way back when. So switching to polar coordinates, we can now write this instead of with respect to u1 and v1, we can really write it with respect to r and theta. 
And actually, there's another little typo error here. Really, if I'm going to call this r d r d theta, this should really be r cosine theta and r sine theta and r squared equals u1 squared plus v1 squared. So just a little notation issue there, but we've transformed our two-dimensional integral in u1 v1 to a two-dimensional integral in r and theta just by doing our change of coordinates in our integral. So now this is the integral I need to evaluate. It's still a double integral, but this lends itself to somewhat simplified mathematics in terms of actually evaluating this in a closed form. So let's continue working on this integral. So let's go ahead and work on this integral. You'll notice in this double integral, which is over r and theta, there is no theta dependence. The u1 squared plus v1 squared turned into... Um, a r squared sine squared plus r sine cosine squared, which you can factor the r squared out, and then the sine squared plus cosine squared equaled 1, so the theta dependence went away. So really, this isn't a double integral. It really is two one-dimensional integrals, and since there's no theta dependence, I can really just bring all of these constants with respect to theta over here, and then do just the single theta integral all by itself of 1 from 0 to 2 pi. So changing to polar was very useful because it split up this kind of combined double integral into really two one-dimensional integrals I have to do, and one of them is just very trivial. So we know what the integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta is. It is 2 pi, so this turns into 2 pi, and that cancels this 2 pi right here. And now we're left with just this integral to work. If I rearrange this just a little bit, and if I bring in the sigma squared inside, then it looks like I have r over sigma squared e to the minus r squared over 2 sigma squared. And this form now is very easy to either work via parts, if you want to actually work out the calculus by yourself, or you can just go to a table lookup. So that's why I did it from table lookup, from the uh, list of calculus integrals that we have posted for the site. From here to here is just applying a table lookup. And then from here to here is substituting back in our dependence, our relationship between r and u0 squared and v0 squared. So we have simplified this integral quite a bit. The probability that we're correct, given signal 0 was sent, is equal to this quantity right here. But keep in mind, u0 and v0 are actually random quantities, and that's what we need to handle next.